Hey, what's up guys? My name is Achiona. Welcome back to my game engine series. So last time we talked about textures. I'll link the video up there. Definitely make sure that you watch that before you move on to this video, because today we're going to be extending our textures to support something called blending. So at the moment, if we take a look at what we've got in the Hazel engine, we loaded this checkerboard texture, which was great. And we loaded it specifically as a RGB texture. So if we take a look at the OpenGL texture class that we wrote, I did mention last time that we have this kind of channels that outputs how many channels our actual texture contains. So what that means is basically per pixel, how many channels of color does the texture contain? In this case, for this specific checkerboard image file, we had three channels, RGB, and that is it. We didn't have any alpha at all. And furthermore, this code at the moment can only handle those three color channels. However, what happens if we try and load a texture that has alpha in it, something that might have a transparent background like this Cherno logo here? Well, let's go ahead and test it out. So with our texture API, it should be as simple as basically just loading in another texture. If I just stop the program here, come over to our texture that we loaded here, we'll add another texture, which I'll call a uh, Cherno logo texture. Uh, and then to load the texture, all we need to do is just copy this line of code and change this to be our Cherno logo texture. And then this actual image file that we're loading is simply going to be Cherno logo.png, which is the image file that I showed earlier. So now to render something with this Cherno logo, let's keep our existing checkerboard background. And for this video, we'll try and actually render that Cherno logo on top of it. So basically what should happen and what you would expect is for the checkerboard background to be rendered behind and then the Cherno logo to be rendered in front. And we should still be able to see that checkerboard background with that kind of Cherno logo composited on top because it has a lot of transparent areas, of course. So we'll copy these two lines of code. This time, instead of binding our texture, we'll just bind our Cherno texture. And really that should be it. Let's just hit a five and see what happens. And as you can see, well, th this just looks really, really weird. And the reason that this is happening and we get this kind of like corrupted look is because we're still kind of treating that actual image data as if it only had three channels of color, which means that the alpha channel is being read as the red channel of like the next pixel or the blue channel, depending on the ordering. So it kind of just creates this whole mess. And of course, something like this could even crash. It's not in this case because RGB requires less data than RGBA and we're actually giving it more data. So we never over flow the buffer or do anything like that, but that's still very far from ideal. So to fix that, all we need to do is respond to this channels input. If I just put a breakpoint here and show you guys exactly what I mean, if I launch this program and we take a look at channels, in this case, the path that we're loading is a checkerboard background. If we take a look at the channels that it has, it has three channels, RGB, we already know that. That's just kind of proving my point. But if I hit F5 and we advance to the next time that we call this function, we have the logo.png file, which has four channels, as you can see. So it is in fact RGBA. So to respond to that, what we would traditionally have in a game engine is just kind of detecting uh, how many channels that has and then maybe converting into a different format. Furthermore, you might want to actually force a particular format for a texture. So there's a lot of different things that you would do in a real game engine. And, but most of all, you wouldn't be loading PNG image files. You would have your own texture format. So I don't want to spend too much time here writing stuff that's going to work for every case that we ever have at the end of our engine, because we'll kind of just tackle that when we get there. So what I'll do now is just support both RGB and RGBA, because that should be pretty much everything we need. Now, of course we might want like, you know, a one channel texture. So maybe something that's kind of grayscale. Um, which we could use with OpenGL by just specifying, you know, GL red or something like that, which would be just kind of just one texture channel. However, we're not going to talk about that until we actually get there because I don't think that we'll need that for a while. So I'll type GL enum and then we have two different formats. You can see the one we're using here is called the internal format. And then the one that we're using in texture sub image is just a format. So texture sub image and, um, Here's the GL enum format parameter. So texture sub image, this is us uploading our actual data. So what we need to supply here is the format of our data. However, this texture storage 2D is defining how OpenGL is going to store our texture. This is different, right? Because you could, for example, upload RGBA data, but then interpret it only as RGB. That's totally fine. We're not doing that. In this case, they're actually going to be the same. 
uh, because we want to obviously interpret RGBA as RGBA, but just letting you guys know that you can actually do different things with this. You could, you don't have to necessarily match these two things, which is why they are two different parameters and we'll treat them as such. So we'll have our internal format, meaning how OpenGL stores it. You could call this OpenGL format or something. I think internal format is a pretty good term for it though. We'll simply check how many channels it has. So if channels equals four, I'll actually expand this, I think. We'll set the internal format to zero. Um, just to initialize it. And then what I'll do is I'll say, if channels equals four, we'll set the internal, so we'll do two things, because we'll have both the internal format and uh, the, for, the data format. So I'll say internal format equals zero, then we'll also have data format equals zero. So definitely can't be zero. So we'll set them over here in this if statement. So if channels is four, then we're gonna go ahead and set the internal format to be RGBA eight, right? So eight meaning eight bits per channel and then RGBA being the format. And then for the format, we don't need that RGBA eight because that's the format of our data. We just simply write, um, and this is called a data format. We just simply write um, GLRGB, which sorry, GLRGB eight because it's the alpha channel version. And then we'll have uh, else if channels equals three, we'll do the same thing but of course we'll set this to RGB eight, which is what it was before and RGB, which is what it was before, right? So now we have this pretty good if statement. What I'll do now, at this point, they should obviously both be set. They shouldn't be zero anymore. So I'll just chuck in a core assert here to make sure that that is the case. So we'll say basically internal format and data format. You should really only need to check one of them because of course they're both zero, but it doesn't matter. We'll set them both up here and we could even like and them together really, because this, this will just be zero, right? If they're both zero. So we'll say, if that is the case, we'll simply write that we're trying to load a format that isn't supported. So format not supported. Okay, and then that way, if we do hit that, because we're trying to load, for example, a texture with, with just one channel per pixel, then we can handle it and expand this and probably revisit this by that stage anyway. Okay, fantastic. So now we replace this with our internal format. And then we replace GLRGB with our data format. Okay, beautiful. So now if we hit, uh, we'll put a breakpoint here, hit F5, verify that everything works. You'll see that for our checkerboard where we have three channels, it does go into this branch and we actually set it to RGB, which is correct. And then for our four channel texture, our channel logo, it goes into RGBA. So now if I just resume this program and we take a look at the result, what we should see is our Cherno texture rendering. Now. This looks pretty hilarious. It should look like this. And furthermore, that checkerboard background uh, should be visible behind it because of course, all of this white area and some of these orange areas should in fact be transparent. So this is still definitely weird. And what I'll actually do is slightly move that Cherno logo out of the way. So the second time we render this, I'll actually apply a translation to it. We'll say GLM translate, GLM map four 1.0 and then GLM Vec three, so by 0.25 and negative 0.25 in the X and Y axes respectively. And then we'll multiply that. Let me just make this a little bit easier to read. And then we'll multiply this with our scale matrix so that we get both the translation and the scale being applied. If I hit F5 and we take a look at what that looks like, basically our Cherno logo should be shifted off a little bit down and to the right. And you can see that's what we get. So this white area would, would really be, it really should be transparent. So let's take a look at why that's not happening and how we can make that happen. So this has to do with blending. And I made a really good OpenGL video specifically about the details. I had like a PowerPoint presentation. I talked about blending functions, how everything gets calculated in depth. Definitely watch that video for more details because I don't want to repeat that here. But basically what we need to do is actually enable blending in OpenGL and set the correct blending function. Basically blending refers to how OpenGL treats alpha and just things with alpha in general. How we get two different colors in OpenGL and we decide that we're gonna combine this orange color which might be slightly transparent. In this case, of course, nothing's like translucent. It's like 100% transparent or it's just full kind of orange. We don't have that here. But regardless, it refers to how we can combine colors together and how, like for example, in this case, all those transparent alpha pixels we have in our Cherno logo, how they should get rendered on top of our checkerboard background. Because in this case, well, the checkerboard background should win out. For that specific pixel, when we try and write that into our color buffer, 
I want that checkerboard background to win. Why? Because the Cherno logo on top for that pixel is completely transparent. That's what blending is all about. Definitely watch that video because if you're not familiar with it, it's really important that you learn that and that you learn actually how it works because it's gonna be super important for this. And since we're kind of moving on with the 2D side of our engine, this stuff's gonna be very, very important. Otherwise, all your sprites will have absolutely no transparency and everything will just be kind of blocks on top of each other, which will be really weird. So anyway, with that in mind, how do we treat blending in our engine? So basically what we need to do is upon initializing our renderer, we don't even have a renderer initialization function yet. So we'll create that, we'll kind of set up the, the, the kind of whole system, I guess, of when we create our renderer, when the window has been created and we, we create our renderer, we have to do a whole bunch of stuff to kind of set everything up, right? Specifically in this case, we want to enable blending. In the future, we'll want to enable various other things like depth testing, numerous other things. We might want to retrieve the capabilities of the actual device that we're rendering on. So this GPU that I'm rendering on, let's try and get all the info for, from what that GPU actually is. Can it, you know, what level of like anti-aliasing can it support? What level of anisotropic filtering can it support? What's the largest texture size that it can support? That kind of stuff, because we need to be aware of what the capabilities of our render, render device actually are so that we can properly render on it and try not to crash. That's how we can kind of support more platforms and more GPUs in the future as well. So that whole thing, and there's a lot of other things that we need to set up as well, but I'm not gonna get into them now. The point is we need a point for us to actually initialize our renderer. And that is exactly where we're gonna set up all the blending stuff in OpenGL. So let's take a look at how we're gonna just architecture that whole thing. So if I come back to our code, we know that inside the application class, we create our window and then we kind of just start pushing the I'm GUI layer, which of course will already do kind of render a code and we kick off our run loop, which renders everything. So this would be a really good place inside our application when we actually initialize and create this window for us to also create our renderer. And the way that we would like to do this, of course, in, is in a cross-platform kind of way because application.cpp is a cross-platform function, nothing to do with OpenGL at all. So we'll kind of follow the pattern of, all, of everything else that we've done that is kind of render API agnostic by just calling renderer init, right? So instead of renderer begin, renderer end, renderer, like what are we, what are we doing in sandbox? We had Hazel renderer submit, so renderer submit, right? That kind of thing. It's just renderer init in this case to initialize it and that should be all that we need. So now we have to follow basically the flow of everything else that we've already done and this pattern will be the same as it is for submit. So the first thing we'll do is make a static function inside renderer called init. We'll go over to our source file and we'll create that function. And then in this case, the actual render command that we used for submission, for example, to draw something was render command draw index. In that same format, we'll just type in render command init. So this is the initialization render command that we give to our renderer. So if we go over to render command and we take a look at how that's set up, you can see that what we do is we simply have inline static voids everywhere that just call the underlying renderer API, whatever that may be. So we'll just have inline static void init and then s renderer api arrow in this, right? Just like that, super easy. So now inside our renderer api, we need to create a virtual function called init. Set that equal to zero, of course, pure virtual. And then if we go over to our OpenGL renderer api, which is our OpenGL specific version of this class, then we simply type in virtual void init override, right? So we implement the function inside this class. And then hopping over to our header file, we'll take void OpenGL render API init. So we'll implement that function. And now we're in a place where we can call OpenGL code. Now I've had a few people in the comments and on Discord just kind of discuss this pattern and be like, isn't that overly complicated? You're touching like four classes here. And the thing is, yeah, I mean, it's not as simple as if we stuck OpenGL code in application or even in renderer or even in like some render API thing. Like why do we have so many layers of abstraction? Why is it not that simple? The reason is that we want a completely platform or specifically render API agnostic way of doing all of these things, right? The, this kind of render API initialization needs to touch our actual render API code. So in this case, we need to call GL commands, open GL commands. If we're dealing with Vulkan, we don't want to be anywhere near this code. This code might not even be compiled and it should still work. And in fact, with this system, it will still work. What if we're, what if we've implemented DirectX 11 or DirectX 12 on Windows, and then we're trying to compile Hazel on Mac or Linux? 
right? In that case, we can't even compile the, the DirectX files, files that include DirectX header files, for example, we can't compile them because those just will not be available on Linux or on Mac or any other platform that doesn't support DirectX. So how do we write this in a way that is completely agnostic? And this is one of the ways that you can do that by having this system where even though it does kind of cause some indirection, basically, if you take a look at what's actually happening, we're just calling render in it, that's, that's calling render command in it, and then render command init is simply calling OpenGL render API init. That's it. So it's kind of like three levels. It's not that bad. And the reason that we have that render command thing, for example, is first of all, so that we can have like, so that we can call these things statically without an interface, without actually having to like, I guess, realize a certain interface or anything like that. We can just do it statically. And also because in the future, we're gonna have this renderer run on a different thread. And for that to work, we need to be able to send commands into a render command queue. And that kind of stuff, by the way, has already been done in the Hazel Delvin branch, which you can get access to by helping to support the series, patreon.com forward slash the churno. Huge thank you as always to all patrons that make this series possible. So if you're interested in how, how this architecture will actually come to be in the future, why it's like this, jumping ahead and taking a look at the Hazel development branch is definitely the best way to do that. So back in our code here, now that we are in a place where we can actually call OpenGL commands, we're gonna go ahead and type in GL enable, GL blend, okay? So we're enabling blending. That by itself is not gonna do much because the, the default blend function is still not gonna work out really well. So what we need to do is actually set up the blend function that we want. And again, my OpenGL video, which I linked, describes this stuff in depth. So if you're more interested in why this is the way that it is and what how this function gets evaluated, I've got like maths and stuff in that video that actually covers this, so check out that video. So our blend function that we want, which is kind of our typical blend function, is gl source alpha for the source factor, and then gl1 minus source alpha for our destination factor. So now that we've enabled blending and set up a blend function, we should just be able to call this init function. And the way that we of course do that is through application and renderer init. We should just be able to call that code at the beginning of initializing our renderer and it should just work. So if we just run our engine right now, we should see hopefully everything blending correctly. And as you can see, we do, that is so much better. This is exactly the result that we kind of expect. What we're gonna do now is just move this Cherno logo back into its original place. So I'll just quickly jump into sandbox app, .cpp, and then just basically get rid of this whole tra GLM translate line and so that we're just scaling it up like we were before. And that's it. Let's hit a five again and we'll see that in action. Okay, and as you can see, we've got that Cherno logo on that checkerboard background. Everything's blending correctly and it looks really good. So that is blending absolutely necessary for any kind of graphics rendering. So I'm glad that we've finally got that in Hazel. Now, if you did catch my video about Hazel and 2D or 3D, where it's exactly going, I'll link it up there in case you missed it. Uh, as you know, we are gonna be continuing on with 2D rendering in Hazel because that's what all of you guys chose, even though it was very, very close, of course. And so this is especially important for that. So I'm glad that we're kind of jamming this in. And just to give you an idea of where we're going, we're gonna be working towards more 2D rendering. Again, if you are interested in 3D and you're not very happy with the outcome of the poll, I did try and make it as fair as possible. I had a real poll. We had like over 4,000 people vote, which is quite a lot. And it did tip slightly towards 2D. So that's why I chose 2D, just because you guys wanted it. But if you're still a little bit unhappy with that, you want to see nice, beautiful 3D rendering, I will be continuing to post kind of devlogs from that Hazel development branch, which is available for patrons. Um, I'll continue to post devlog specifically about that and show off what I'm working on because I will still continue building up that 3D renderer um, in Hazel in the development branch and keep pushing that out to patrons. And that will of course form the basis for these kind of game engine series videos when we eventually finish 2D and move on with 3D. So it's kind of cool because on these videos we'll be developing 2D and you can kind of see all that and I'll kind of teach that properly. But then the Hazel development branch will contain all the 3D code, which is a way for me to almost build 2D and 3D at the same time. And then as a reward for helping to support the series, you can get access to that all that lovely 3D code. I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.